The land known as the Holy Land is the birthplace of three of the world's principal religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and has been a contested area since 1200 BC. The original inhabitants, the Canaanites and Philistines, were conquered in 1000 BC by the Jews, who remained sovereign for about 300 years. For the next 1500 years, a series of conquests and occupations left a residual Jewish population in the area of less than 20%, the rest being predominantly Muslim and Christian Arabs. During the 1800s, a nationalist movement among the Jews and diaspora emerged in response to persecution. These Jews, known as Zionists, sought to re-establish Jewish sovereignty in Palestine. During World War I, the major imperial powers, including Britain, France, and Russia, were allied against Germany and Turkey and vied for control of the Middle East and its newly discovered oil fields. The Zionists skillfully played off the need for the support of the Jewish communities in each of these nations for the war effort in order to get backing for their settlements in Palestine. Zionism initially, you see, is a secular movement. In Zionism, when you have the state of Israel created, it's a secular state. Zionism comes out of people who broke away from religious Judaism in Eastern Europe and realized they could not get assimilation into European culture in Russia because of all the anti-Semitism, unlike what was going on in Western Europe. And they needed a country where they could call their own. And so they looked back to where they had been 2,000 years before. Uh, and so once they began to get backing from individuals, philanthropists, the Rothschilds of uh, Paris particularly, you know, they were able to begin something. Uh, you have one wave, the first Aliyah, and then you have a second in 1905 where David Ben-Gurion comes over. Uh, and these people were highly militant. And they criticized the first wave because the first wave came over and while they purchased land, absentee landowners by the way, not Palestinians, uh, who had bought up the land of the 19th century, they did not expel the Palestinians. They used them to work and as labor. And when you had the militant Zionists, who were very close to communism, far right, far left wing, hardline people, uh, came in, they said only Jewish labor can build a new Israel and you cannot have Palestinian labor, you see. So they're very critical of this. And at the same time, they were quite open about their objectives. So the Palestinians were very aware of this, you say, and very aware of Zionist objectives, and Zionists were quite willing and aware uh, to confront and, 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 and take on Palestinian objection. We really don't know what would have happened. Zionism might not have gone anywhere except for World War I. And then in World War I, when you have this conflict that includes the Middle East, you have the imperial powers allied, Britain and France with Russia, who had often been at odds, totally at odds, during most of the 19th century, quite often over the scramble for power, the scramble for territories in Africa, as well as Southeast Asia. You have this tremendous explosion. This wasn't the beginning of imperialism, but it was the real push, we might say, uh, and much more occupation, particularly by France and North Africa. Uh, well, what many people don't know is that in World War I, your subjects from these, these colonies or areas that you controlled, you had them fighting for you in Europe, not just in the Middle East. You had tens of thousands of Indians fighting there, etc. Many Muslims. The French had many people from North Africa. They had people from West Africa, Senegal, etc. All in the trenches. You see, you want them happy. You don't want them opposed to you. And they're very worried about Muslims, particularly responding to this caliphal call for holy war against the British, French, and, and Russians. So you want to get an Arab leader to revolt, and there had been a lot of contact with the Sharifa Saint of Mecca before. So finally you get this correspondence from the last five months of 1915, in which it appears that the British have promised independence in many areas, with only certain areas excluded, and that these include from Hussein's point of view, he asked for it, Palestine, as well as Syria, uh, with Iraq having certain special qualifications because the British wanted to go in there to protect oil in the Persian Gulf. And Hussein had agreed with this. Well, it, technically, Palestine was never included in the final version of the Hussein McMahon correspondence, but the British had no intention of living up to any of it because they'd already had the French 
promise for Syria. And so they were very vague about what might be excluded, subject to the interests of our ally France. Hussein agreed with this. And what was subject to the interests of our ally France was all of Syria, which then, in the sykes picot Agreement of 1916, ang the Anglo-French Agreement became, was, was awarded as a sphere of influence or control, Syria and Lebanon, to uh, France. And the British got control of uh, Iraq. Palestine was to be neutral. Then Zionism comes along again because the leader of Zionism is in Britain. Hein Weizmann has many close ties with British statesmen. And they want a declaration promising Palestine to them. And it's finally made in November of 1917 for wartime reasons. Weizmann has many close ties with British statesmen. And they want a declaration promising Palestine to them. And it's finally made in November of 1917 for wartime reasons. Because by this time, the, uh, the Russians were about to collapse. You had one revolution in March, and now you're going to have a second one in November where the, the Bolsheviks come in. You're trying to forestall that. And if Russia goes out of the war, you're terrified. Because Germany can then put all its troops against you and France on the Western Front. The United States isn't in there yet. And so, while there was a great deal of sympathy in the Lloyd George, David Lloyd George uh, government, and Arthur Balfour was the uh, uh, foreign minister for Zionism, wartime expediency played a major role. Because the argument was, the way it was presented by Weizmann and people, was that if you promise Palestine to the Jewish people as a national home, then you get so many Bolsheviks who are Jews, they'll be totally sympathetic and they'll stay in the war. Conversely, there are many Americans who want to see this, and this may influence Woodrow Wilson to actually commit troops, because Wilson had committed the United States to the war much earlier, but troops had not really come in, you see. And as a matter of fact, it had no influence, but troops did begin coming in in January and February of 1918, and without them, Germany might have won the war in the major offensive that happened in March. Here you have the victorious powers coming together. And one of the deals after the war was that the victors could take all the colonial possessions of the losers. So there's this gradual parceling out between the British, the French, and the Japanese particularly um, of these lands. And how do you justify this? Because Woodrow Wilson really opposed this. He said, his 14 points, of course, of January 1918, the, the wishes of the, um, the, the inhabitants of a country should be considered as the primary concern if we're uh, allowing uh, European rulers to come in. If they're not going to be independent, then the, the will of the population must be considered. So it can't be colonies. And so you created the idea of mandates. And a mandate meant that anyone who took over a territory new or otherwise, and say, Palestine, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, which had never existed as countries before, are now divided up. And they become countries, and they become mandatories of France and uh, Britain. And the way you get around the idea of colonial spoils and all that is to say, the mandate obligates you to prepare the inhabitants of these countries for self-government at some time in the future. But then Palestine became a special case because the British violated the provisions of the mandate for Palestine because they put the Balfour Declaration into the Palestine mandate, you see. What did this mean? It meant that for Palestine, the wishes of the inhabitants, 90% Arab, would not be listened to and they would not be developed for independence. It would be Jews, once they came in through immigration, you see, they would be allowed to develop. And so it's really with the Palestinian mandate and the violation of the mandatory provisions to give the Zionists the right to create a majority of Jews to create a Palestinian state that the, the real Palestinian is Zionist conflict begins with very few illusions on both sides. And the Zionists themselves knew quite well that the Palestinians had national identity and they were fighting and, and Jabotinsky uh, Vladimir Jabotinsky was head of the right-wing revisionist party, Likud is that today, they wanted to control Jordan as well, Transjordan at the time. Forget just the West Bank. But he said, look, ladies and gentlemen, he said in 1921, he said, I've never heard of any people uh, welcoming the people who are going to conquer them and take them over and deprive them of their land. We're going to have to fight them. And his idea was that this would be an iron wall, that you had to 
impose your will on Arabs, the Palestinians, to show them that you are all powerful and ultimately they will submit. So the Zionist attitude was that you were going to have to, to crush uh, the Palestinians. Now the Palestinians really didn't have very much power. They couldn't get any money in from outside. Uh, the labor Zionists, the official Zionist movement, people don't know this, was not the most powerful movement in Palestine, even though it was the official representative to Britain of Zionism. Behind Weizmann in London, uh, Ben-Gurion in uh, Palestine. But the major investment in Palestine was by independent Jewish investors. The Americans, Judge Brandeis, Louis Brandeis leading there, broke away from Zionism, labor Zionism, because they didn't want socialism and didn't want to be controlled. So it was really private investment more than anything else, not the socialist labor Zionism, that got most of the land that you actually bought, which was by 1948 still only one third of, of the land. Uh, and Palestinians were still two thirds of the population. When Hitler comes to power in 1933, you begin to have a, a situation, and everyone knows what Hitler is about, and when he comes in, you begin to get, of course, anti-Jewish laws, racist laws, uh, forbidding marriage with Aryans and, and things like this, and then it gets worse, you're barred from employment, uh, and even before you really get the, the major persecution that's going to come in the later 30s, although the, the camps, the concentration camps, were really built for political opponents, mainly Catholics. Uh, and some Protestant, not for Jews. They were put in there later on after 1941. But you begin to get Jews looking at this and saying, where can we go? And the Nazis are trying to encourage them to go. And there's actually an arrangement made with Zionists in Palestine so that German Jews who want to go can go to Palestine and have the equivalent of their wealth, they're leaving their property behind, transferred so that they get the value of their possessions in Palestine, you see. And so suddenly, in 1933 to 1936, 37, you almost triple the populate, Jewish population of Palestine because of these events in Europe. And the wealth that comes over is very significant because this influx, and some of it's from anti-Semitism against Jews in Poland as well during the time, is able to build a, an infrastructure, an industrial infrastructure, that you've never had before. You get a middle class, upper middle class people with money to invest. You get new industries, which are not going to affect the Palestinian Arabs. They're totally separate from it. And this is quite a different class of people than the penniless workers who are coming over in the 20s that the labor Zionists were bringing over. So it transforms things. And with many other issues that are going on, it ultimately leads to an Arab revolt that is going to uh, happen from 1936 and will not be f fully crushed until 1939. And this is an Arab revolt. In part, it is despair against what is seen suddenly. You know, the Jewish presence hasn't been that much before, but now suddenly you're getting a very large Jewish presence. Uh, so you seem to be losing ground in this way. You become aware, some of you, that your leadership may have been some of it selling land to, uh, to Zionists. Uh, you have increasing expulsion from lands that are bought because the idea of Jewish labor meant also that this was inalienable Jewish land. And that meant that once Jews bought land, it could never be sold to a non-Jew. And Arabs living on the land would be thrown off. And so while the percentage is not that large, it is you know, several thousand people who are going into shanty towns around the cities, Haifa, uh, Jaffa, etc. In, in the 30s. And so there's a displaced class of people here as well. And there's growing resentment as what is seen as the inability of the Palestinian leadership to oppose this in any form whatsoever. Uh, and so you ultimately get this revolt that is sparked actually by, it's interesting, this man, Sheikh Ezzedim al Qassam. Uh, there's a Qassam brigade in Hamas today a Muslim preacher who had been ministering to these displaced workers and saying around in the shanty towns and saying that Islam is the only way you'll have any pride because you're being you know displaced you have no property you're homeless etc cetera, etc cetera. and so the revolt explodes dies down for a bit 
And the British come in and propose a partition of Palestine in the Peel Commission report of 1937. And it's in reaction to that that you get the real explosion of the uh, Arab revolt from later 1937 with the major casualties down to no early 1939. And at one point, the Palestinian rebels control most of Palestine in the hinterland, not the cities. Uh, and the British are unable to do very much because, particularly in 38, because of tensions in Europe, Hitler, Czechoslovakia, etc. Now, the Jewish state was quite small, and it followed more or less the land holdings in the northwest, essentially, and northern parts of Palestine. It was only about 25% of Palestine, but it had the wealthiest land, and it also had an equal population of Arabs who would have to leave. You'd have forcible transfer. Presumably they'd be reimbursed, but they had been there first and they had developed the citrus in industry there long before the Zionists came in. So there was that sense of injustice. Then, although the Arabs got more land, there was also this sense that there was no Palestinian state because the way the British proposed it, this is a little complicated, the state was to include Transjordan you see, which had been created in 1921 and given to one of the sons of the Sharif Hussein of Mecca, the Emir Abdullah. Well, Abdullah had been very interested in aligning himself to Zionists and moderate Palestinians to get Jewish investment in Transjordan because he, he, economically it was a basket case. And so he was, but he was very close to the British. So when the Peel Commission report comes in, the Arab Palestinian Arab area is going to be part of Transjordan with Abdullah, who's an Arab from the Hejaz, uh, you know, uh, the Red Sea part of Arabia, as ruler. It's not going to be a Palestinian state, whereas the Zionists, the Jews, are going to get a Jewish state, you see. So the Arabs are opposed to this from the beginning, in part because they're simply not going to rule, you see, and also because they see that the land they're getting, although it's much more, is of much less value. The Zionists were upset because they wanted more land, you see, because after all, let's face it, Hitler's aims are quite clear at this point. And on the one hand, the Zionist leadership wants to get any state so that they can control it and take in as many people as they can, you see. Uh, but the majority of Zionists initially opposed this, and finally Ben-Gurion per persuaded them, look, go along with this and we'll see if we can get more land out of this. Well, this never came to fruition simply because the British Foreign Office said, we don't want an independent state of anyone in Palestine because World War II is coming. There's going to be war in the Mediterranean Europe. And if we have independent leaders there, we won't be able to act. So they put the kibosh on, on the whole deal. Uh, but one thing that the Zionist leadership did assure its following of at the time was, look, we can accept the state in a small area now and we'll simply expand later on. And they actually did this in 1948. The, the, the Zionists were never committed to the boundaries of the partition with the Palestinian area. You say, they never were. They assumed that at some point they might be able to take more land and expand. And so the Arabs in part rebelled against that as well as against their own leaders. Uh, and it turned into a bloodbath in which then Palestinians were turning against each other. Uh, and the British were aligned with the Zionists in terms of crushing it. And once you thought you had peace in uh, Europe after the Munich agreements when Chamberlain came back in October 38, we have peace for our time, then the British were able to send a lot of troops and uh, armored cars over to Palestine and crush the Arab revolt. Now, ironically, as soon as they did that, they then turned around in a very cynical deal and undermined their commitment to the Zionists. In a 1939 white paper that came out in May, but they've been planning this for a while. Because here they are looking at, you know, ensuing war, which is coming ever closer. And they're saying, well, the Arab countries surrounding Palestine are getting increasingly upset at what's going on in Palestine. And it's safe to say that up to that time, uh, of the Arab revolt in 1936, you had not had any major concern. You had delegations from Arab states, but keep in mind they were all occupied by Europeans. The French were in Syria and Lebanon, 
Iraq had become independent in 1932, but with a deal for British air bases and things. But nonetheless, it was much more independent. Egypt was under the control of the British. So, but once you had this Arab revolt, then Islamic elements in Egypt, particularly, begin to call attention to what's going on. This is the Muslim Brotherhood that had been founded in 1929 by Hassan Obama. And they defined this as Islamic land, Muslim land. And they shamed the government into calling conferences, you see, to become more concerned. And so it's only from that time that you begin to get people, Arabs in other areas, really committed and starting to donate. Well, there's not much you can do. Well, the British are looking at this, and they're looking at the war coming up, and you have Italy and Libya, right? And you assume you'll be fighting against Mussolini. And you have the French in North Africa, but you're worried more about Egypt and the Suez Canal, which is the major thing. Well, what if you begin fighting, and you're fighting the Italians in Libya, and you have a major Arab uprising behind you, not just in Egypt, which almost happened, by the way, in Egypt 1942, but also elsewhere, behind your back. So you have a situation then where, how are we going to keep these people quiet? Because these Arab delegations are getting really angry because their populations are getting angry. We've got to promise them something. So in the white paper of 1939, you actually say that the Balfour Declaration was never intended to create a Jewish state against the will of the Palestinian Arabs. Well, that's nonsense. You know, it was. They were never consulted. But you're now saying this. And as a result, you're saying that you are going to stop Jewish immigration. It's going to be very limited, 5,000 a year for five years. Uh, I'm sorry, 15,000 a year for five years, up to 75,000. You're stopping land sales, because this is the other major friction, immigration and land sales. And in 10 years, this is said arbitrarily, you will negotiate with the Arabs and the Zionists about what type of state and if they can't agree, then you will, the British, unilaterally impose a solution. Now, what that would mean was a state in Palestine that was two-thirds Arab and one-third Jewish. See what I mean? No Israel, no Jewish state in Palestine. So, you were doing this not out of sympathy for the Palestinian Arabs. You could care less about them. You just crushed them. You killed an awful lot of them. Uh, you were worried about your Arab rulers and these states around and uprisings that might divert attention and troops from what you were going to do elsewhere. Well, the Zionists were infuriated, but they had no choice, you see. They had to go along with this, and Ben-Gurion said, well, fight the white paper uh, as if there's no war. Well, we'll fight the war as if there's no white paper. Initially, we'll cooperate, and then we'll fight the white paper as if there's no war. We'll fight the war first, forget the white paper, then we'll fight the British and the white paper. And so once the threat in, towards Egypt and the Suez Canal receded with the Battle of El Alamein late in 1942, and the British began pushing uh, the Germans, who'd come in, of course, Rommel and the Africa Corps, back to Tunisia, from 1943 on, Zionists in Palestine, with allies in the British Army and Zionists in Egypt, began stealing arms from the British to prepare for war against the British after the war was over. And they also had many people who fought with the uh, British Army in Europe. But these people retained their ties to their superiors in the Haganah, the, the Jewish uh, defense groups, and they were prepared then to align uh, and to use their training against the British after the war, if this was deemed uh, necessary. At this time then, once you get the horror of the Holocaust being known, uh, and that, the Zionists then have an excellent case to claim that because of what happened to the Jewish people, uh, it is all the more necessary to have you know, a haven for them that can only be a, a state of Israel. And the Palestinian Arabs, being leaderless, are saying that we are, we're not responsible for the Holocaust. We oppose that, we condemn that, but we also resist you know, the developments that the Zionists are claiming they have a right to, to have, namely to have a state. And you begin then to have this whole period from 1945 to 48 in which the United States plays an increasingly important, important role. Uh, this had begun in 1942 in the uh, Biltmore program. There was a meeting at the Biltmore Hotel in May of 42, uh, where the Zionists met to try and mobilize support among American Zionists, because m most American Jews were not committed Zionists. And you wanted to arouse them also to the horrors of what was going on and try to push the, the Roosevelt administration to do something also about the uh, atrocities in Europe and maybe do something about the camps. This did not happen. 
But this also led to a major split within Zionism because Weizmann, with Heim Weizmann, was still in England, and he wanted to negotiate vis-à-vis -vis the British. Ben Gurion was saying he was based in Palestine, but he had come to this meeting in New York. Forget the British. It's facts on the ground, and we're going to mobilize opinion in the United States against the British if necessary in order to do this. And the history is very complicated from 1945 to 48, but essentially the British are so weakened by World War II, people don't realize this, that they wound up much worse off, finally, than the French, the Italians, and the Germans, because we gave those people a Marshall Plan to develop their economies to stop the appeal of communism, you see what I mean? And we rebuilt Japan for anti-communist reasons. But the British economy remained terribly weak well into, on, into the 1960s. And in the winter of 46, 47, gas, you couldn't buy gas for cars for six months. And the winter was so bad that people froze in their homes because there was not enough coal. And the British were still trying to maintain their empire. But you also were so frustrated with Zionist resistance and terrorist attacks against the British and the United States, Truman, for sometimes domestic political reasons, was, you know, making statements favorable to Zionism, infuriating the British. Well, as a result of all of this, in William Roger Lewis's term, uh, the Foreign Secretary, Ernest Bevan of Great Britain, hurled Palestine into the United Nations. You know? Technically, they still had the mandate, and they said they would withdraw in 48, but they were no longer responsible for it. The United Nations uh, sent a... Uh, committee to evaluate this in the summer of 47 and they recommended partition and the Zionists eagerly accepted this and the Palestinian Arabs didn't because they were still two-thirds of the population and they felt this was unjust now you can argue what you want about whether they should have all their fault uh, and certainly the Israelis have said ever since that the Palestinians never lost an opportunity to miss never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity but a lot of powers, including Israel, had quite, quite to make quite, make quite sure at times that the Palestinians would miss that opportunity. You know, the conditions would be such that they would feel they had no choice but to reject something. And, but nonetheless, this partition, which was approved uh, in the UN after Thanksgiving in 1947, officially recognized two states, Palestine and Israel, to be declared you know, within six months. <laughs>